Welcome to 74 Escapes new podcast series, Breaking Bread with Vera Lulu. I'm Vera, and I will take you on a gastronomic journey to explore food as an expression of cultural identity. I'll be hosting chefs and industry professionals from all over the world to discuss everything about this art form that really nourishes our souls. Let's start. Joao Caras is a historian of political sciences. Uh, Joao's primary focus is cultural history. He curated the Museo do Pau Bread Museum, in addition to several curatorial works for the art exhibition. In recent years, he has been dedicated to the study of cultural relations between gastronomy and history. He also created and directed the documentary Atero e Prato, Behind the Plate. And today I'm so blessed to speak with my friend and chef Joao. Welcome, chef. How are you today? Super fine. Very happy to be here to talk with you. And I don't know if I deserve the label chef, but thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> um, Joe, I think it's fair to say that we share a genuine love for food. Where did it all start for you? So, um, from the side of my mom, um, my, my, my family from my mom is a Jew family from the, the Eastern Europe that came to Brazil in the 20s. And my grandfather and my grandmother used to like to go out to have dinner in a fine restaurants and stuff like that. And I used to go with them a lot. And they all also loved to travel, so maybe I took that from them. And in the other hand, my father comes from a very traditional family, like in terms of a very old population from Portuguese immigrated to Brazil in the 16th or 17th century. And from Minas Gerais, which is the countryside of Brazil, it is a place where everyone cooks, and it's very related to nature and to cooking. So I had one family that loves to cook, and the other family that loves to go out and have, the, have dinner. So I think it was pretty natural for me to, to be involved somehow with food. <laughs> what a beautiful environment to grow up in. I'm very jealous. <laughs> yeah, it was very funny because in one side, someone was working in the industry here in the fabrics, and the other side of the family were like in the, the countryside and a very a rural environmental, so it was, it was very nice for, to have both of these two worlds. Mm -hmm. So you recently conceived and directed a film, A Terra del Prato, Behind the Plate, uh, a view to the world's finest chefs and their philosophies. What led you to this project? So um, in just, I, I, I was getting acquainted to the area of astronomy in terms of uh, like knowing professionals and chefs and stuff. Let's say somehow some sometime around the thir 2013 i got closer to this subject and to this world and then uh, in 2015 i was during my uh, phd i was studying the theme i did in phd thesis but i was also traveling a lot because of food and i got this amazing opportunity to be in spain and uh, and stay some days in andoris house in uh, andoris from Ugaris house and then I went to visit Kiki da Costa as well. And I was thinking, it's such a privilege to be part of this and to have an opportunity to chat with these people and listen to them talking for some time and not just eating their food, but mainly listen. And there's so many things that they do that is very related to cultural history. Um, and they have like the everyday problems of those chefs are if the ingredients are is good enough, is nature is, is doing this way or that way, if the people are poor or not. So, there's a lot of the things that I study in a very academic as a way that the chefs deal with in their everyday business. And I said, maybe I should ask them these things and try to make this, those guys talk and try to make those guys reflect about these, these, these issues. So what I did first was to start interviewing them with a very shitty camera uh, to YouTube, to put in YouTube. So I did 80 interviews was a lot of interviews. I, I have a 33 in my YouTube account, but I, did, I, I couldn't put everyone because I had to do the subtitles and it takes a lot of time and work. And then I got this incredible material, but very badly filmed, so it was terrible. And I thought maybe I should put it all together in a documentary. And then I, I called a friend of mine, he's a, a director for, for movies, and he said, okay, it's too shitty to do it. We can do it with this material, you know, the audio is terrible, the video is terrible, it's, 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 not, it's not able to do it. 
but we can start a new project. And I said, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. So I found a third friend that said, okay, I'll put some money in it and then we do it. So we started doing this in 2016. No, sorry, 2018. We, uh, we traveled to the team, with the crew to San Sebastian during the fifth best and the 20 years birthday of Mugaritz. And then there I had a very good opportunity to catch a lot of chefs in the same place at the same moment. So it was very easy to record the interviews. So we did uh, almost all the important Spanish chefs um, from Ferrandria, Alberdria, Andoni, Victor from Echevarri, Aita from Ocano, the Hoca brothers, Kiki da Costa, Alberdria. I mean, it was amazing. It was such, such a very good opportunity to get them. Also, Dan Barber was there for the, for the party and he's a good friend. So I said, okay, you're gonna give me an interview here in Bilbao, doesn't matter, it's not in Blue Hill. And so it was a very nice opportunity. Then with this crew of chefs filmed already, it was very easy to call the other ones and say, okay, I did, I'm doing this documentary. I have these, all these people recorded. You want to give an interview? So we started shooting and we went to Denmark and to France. So we did La Ducasse, uh, Bertrand Rebeau, uh, some winemakers. And then uh, in Denmark, I tried to take the yeah, generation uh, under René Hezepi to try to get the new guys. So Christian, uh, Matt Orlando, uh, but also um, Rasmus from Geranium and some other people, like uh, Roberto Flor from the, uh, used to be from uh, Nordic Lab, and now he's in Skylab, so it's, uh, it's a scientist. And also the guys from the, 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 the ceiling company that used to work in Noma and Lars. And, uh, and then in Brazil, we did Alexa Tala, of course, and uh, Manu Bufara, which is a very talented young, chef, Brazilian chef, and she's rising now. And she's about to open a restaurant in New York some, sometime. I don't know when because of the crisis, but she was about to. And then we went to Peru to film with Virgilio, Pia, and Malena. So it was a very nice opportunity as well. And so the, the idea was to make all these people to talk to um, about the, the land, and from the land, how, how it's for, the gastronomy is formed and what's the issues on forming, the, on making a way of eating and uh, cooking, to passing through memory and finishing with the question of how to deal with the environment in these days, which was not the main, the, the main question, but became the main question when we started seeing that everybody was repeating a lot about the environment. And then we were finishing the documentary at the same time there is the global crisis of a pandemic going on, so it was very actual. To, to see about the COVID crisis and uh, people saying, okay, you have, we have to behave be better with nature. We have to, so it was super, super actual. And then I think this is, this is how we, we, we got there. And it was a very nice opportunity as well because we could travel a lot and, and see a lot of It people. sounds like such an amazing project, uh, really is. I, I really admire this. Um, and tell me about your Casa de Carbonara. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very funny story because I just got, I, I mean, 2013, I moved to this place. I was just divorced, like the same, same day, I almost, you know, I, I signed the, the papers some days before the, the movie. Then I moved here with a dog, a very big empty house, not very big, but a big empty house. Uh, still having to put furniture in place and books and art and all this stuff. And, but I love to cook since I was young, um, especially from 18 on, I, 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 lo I love to cook every day and invite friends to my place, my father's place when I lived there. And, and then uh, I started inviting my friends to come here because it was big, I was alone, but we could stay until whenever we want to, we could party all night if we need, want to. And so we were cooking and all, all, always around the, there's this counter between my, my living room and the kitchen. So it was always in this space and cooking and drinking Negronis or wine or whatever. And then one day uh, I was uh, making a job fun with my Italian chef that lives in Brazil saying that I cook a carbonara better than him. And he was saying it's not, and yes, no, yes, no. So I tagged in the location in Instagram. I tagged the uh, Casa do Carbonara, which is Carbonara's home or something like that. And um, Carbonara's house of Carbonara, I don't know. And then it was very funny because he got super um, like angry 
But the same thing, and people start tagging it when they came here. And Instagram was right beginning to, 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 to grow for food. It was like the perfect moment, I think, at least in Brazil. Um, and then I started posting food a lot because I was also, you know, feeling a bit void in my personal life. So I didn't want to post anything um, more personal. So I was just posting food, food and food and some other things, but mainly food. And I got into this mood of food and cooking and like, and then posting the picture of, of the food they cooked and posting Casa do Carbonara and then food or the restaurant. And, and then people started asking, where the hell is this place? Uh, is it a restaurant? And instead of saying, no, it's just a guy's That house. was my thought in the beginning. I was very confused. <laughs> so instead of saying, no, no, it's just a house. We said, yeah, it's a very difficult restaurant to get in. It's a very... Uh, exclusive place and stuff like that just to make fun of people i had no not not so many followers by the time so it was okay and then someday a, guy, a friend of mine said okay you should, maybe you should register this name open a website a location and, buy, and use the instagram casa do carbonara and not just your your own instagram just to make sure that no one makes another place called like that here i said okay let's do it so i had this website going on and this life around my, my place here started growing as we see more people and more chefs, chefs coming from abroad that someone was receiving, brought them here. So it became a place to meet people of gastronomy somehow. And then I started sharing not the photos of the things and not uh, the showing off the experience over here because it was useless. I, I, I don't believe in that or something, but trying to share some ideas of things that we talked about here. And so I started putting some texts and I started putting some, uh, these interviews I did in Instagram. I started putting some articles from other people. So I, I was trying to share ideas more than anything in this website. So it became like a virtual space for what happens here in the uh, in internet. I'm not very good in actualizing it. So there's not so many things. But somehow it, it's, it's that. Casa do Carbonara is much more that than the actually, actual place, you know? The actual so place tell me, just the forever debate, um, fresh pasta versus hard pasta. <laughs> no, hard pasta forever, yeah. Dry pasta. <laughs> it, 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 it I tend to lean towards that. Too. As much pleasure as I get from doing fresh pasta for other people, personally, I prefer dry. Yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use a sauce that is with eggs and put some pasta with eggs already. I mean, you can do it. I, I believe also that carbonara is a very, very popular recipe, uh, Roman uh, recipe, like from Lazio region. And I don't, I don't believe in this idea of the having the one very right recipe of carbonara because it's, if, it, if it's a popular recipe as it is, Everybody used to do it at other places in a kind of different way. Of course, they're not using cream or whatever, but they are using sometimes pancetta, sometimes guanciale, sometimes uh, pecorino, sometimes parmigiano, sometimes Absolutely. both. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes the black pepper, sometimes another pepper because it's a poor, it's a poor dish. It's like a, it's a cucina povera. It's not something that cucina you povera. can say. It's like a. It is not a Sabria Savarin wrote that in the 18th century. You know, it's it's very different. Um, it's. I personally found that I love to leave Picarino out. It's, it's a bit too acidic and it cuts through the richness. And every time I made it for my mom, she does not like Picarino and uh, my pasta, so. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's different. Different. the Picarino is, is something very crazy because the Picarino that Italia, Italia exports, usually, it's very bad. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's the, the cure is so hard, so it's, the taste is not so good, but if you could take a very good pecorino, it's much better than parmigiano for that. But I, I find the same here. The pecorino I, I got here is very not good. So I try to find some other brands that sometimes someone brings, buy a lot of it and, and store in the fridge. But uh, I mean, I, I prefer pancetta than guanciale. I think pancetta really? is more- See, I'm the more, opposite. I per honestly prefer guanciale. I think when when you no I I think I mean when I got some some things that is, is Brazilian meat I prefer guanciale 
because it's softer mm -hmm. and it's, it's more delicate. Mm -hmm. But if you get a very nice Italian pancetta, for me, it's unbeatable because it's meaty and it's very well curated. And I personally believe that probably there were much more uh, in the 40s and 50s in Italy, there was much more carbonaras with uh, pancetta than with panciale. It was a time of crisis, economical crisis in Italy, and a pork has a big belly like this and a jaw like this. So it's, it makes a lot of sense to use. Uh, cheaper cut. So trick question. Who do you think is the most influential chef these days? Mm, I mean, I probably would say three chefs. That I, could, I think it's they are equally influential or four. One, it's Rene Hezebi for sure, because of all the Nordic movement and how it grew Absolutely. to something. I think Andoni is a very influential chef when you go to terms like um, educating a new generation of chefs. If you look at how many people pass through to Mugaris and how he put ideas in front of uh, creativity and techniques. So it's, um, I think this is very inspiring for a lot of chefs. I think he's more a chef from chefs than a chef from foodies because food is like luxury and like very tasty food. And sometimes you go to Mugaris, it's a very crazy experience. It's not about taste itself. But it's one of my favorite ones, and I think it's very influential when you look of like from um, David Tutin to Brazilian chefs to a lot of people pass by this kitchen and are inspired by what he says and he does. Then I think that Passar, Alain Passar is, is a monster. I, I want to do a hashtag is like Passar is bigger than Bocuse. But <laughs> I want to agree with people. Have you ever had the um, meal in his garden? Yeah, I got, I got one. How soon. fantastic is it? What an experience. It, it was amazing. I got one day, it was just a vegetables menu. It was super nice. Oh, really? Because when I went with Ais 50 years ago, it was, of course, lots of vegetables, but it was maybe like nine hour lunch. And meat came at the end, but we were so already stuffed with vegetables that meat was, I mean, nobody could even eat. It was, it was a fantastic day, but it was primarily vegetables. Yeah, meat came at the end. No, he, he cooks meat um, amazingly, but uh, this, this experience of eating vegetables in front of the vegetables were super nice. Was super nice. And I think then Barbara as well, it's a uh, good complete with them Barbara because he's uh, so much ahead of everyone in terms of thinking, uh, gastronomy and the ways of eating. And, uh, and I think he's a very forward thinking guy. And, and I think that everyone listens to him whenever he wants to say something. So. Uh, I think I would put these four together, but you could say that 10 years ago was Fehandria for sure, and that is a, an arguably, and then you can go and look at other guys. This is just my, my four, but. Ja, you do a wonderful job curating art exhibitions. Um, did you realize how big your impact was? And if yes, when was the mo most moment of realization? Sorry? In terms uh, of art. Art. I'll, re I'll repeat. You do a wonderful job curating art exhibitions. What drives you in terms of um, curating? I have this, it, it was funny, but I, I always thought that some, somehow, I'm, I'm always very uh, close to the idea of uh, showing people that doesn't know things, you know? So I did an exhibition here that I was I created, I produced, I did all the things I could to make it happen put my money from my pocket, from a, a painter from a Col de Paris uh, called Michel Kikoin from Bielorussia. And this guy came to Paris with uh, Soutine and he was a friend of Modigliani. And somehow I found that some, some works of him was, were in Brazil. And I did uh, create an exhibition about him. And it was so nice to present a, a painter that no one in Brazil ever heard about it here. And he's a super nice guy. He has his place in history, although he's not the very most expensive guy, but, and it was super nice to do it. And also it was very nice to create exhibitions of uh, Brazilian, uh, let's say naive painter, pa painters or folk painters. And um, I had one exhibition in a uh, gallery here it was super nice, but also an amazing opportunity to write a, a part of a book in for Fondation Cartier about mm -hmm. a, a painter from Brazilian painter. It was super nice. He's a 
kind of mad, so has a mental disease problem. And he was discovered in the 60s and he's still alive. And they made this big exhibition about the folk art in Latin America. And I was invited to create the part of these artists and write a text in a very beautiful book. So I think this is a very, very nice moment in, in, in doing that. But for a long time, I had an art gallery as well. So I did a lot of curatorial stuff that it doesn't, it's not that signed because it's, uh, you represent the artist. So you, you select his work, you, you produce exhibition, but you're not writing the text or doing a more mental job, let's say like this. And I did, I did a lot of other things relating to not um, art itself, but with history as well. So history of the, music, the bread in this bread museum. I was invited to do a, something on coffee, but it, didn't, uh, it was not built, but I did the, the curatorial part of it. And things like that, it's super nice to work in this, but always with history together. Tell me your favorite artist. Uh, I, have a, I have a trio, you know. Uh, it, would, <laughs> it would be Yves Klein, uh, Joaquin Torres Garcia from Uruguay, and uh, probably Mojigliani or Soutine. I would be. I agree two. with you on the third part. Or one of those <laughs> three guys in the same period. <laughs> but Yves Klein for sure. Um, I have a question for you. What do you think is the difference between artists and the curators? Do you think they share the same theoretical background? Sorry, I didn't hear so well. What do you think are the, is the difference between um, the artists and the curators? Do you think they share the same theoretical background, in your opinion? I don't think so. I, I, I think actually the opposite. I think uh, the artists should not That's be. That's a different about beast. Yeah, yeah, I think there are two different beasts. And uh, one has to happen in order to the other to happen. I, I don't think it's... It, sometimes it can collude in something, but it's, it's very specific. Um, I think that there was something about that when you look back in the vanguard of the beginning of the 20th century, when people was trying to shock somehow. But mainly in an everyday job, I think it's two different works. I think what drives the artist is not the same thing that drives the creator. And um, and I think that what drives the creator in different in different jobs is very different as well. If I do a contemporary exhibition, I want to show some aspects of the new work of the artists. Or if I do a retrospective, is another thing. If I do a retrospective from someone is dead, is a very different thing as well. So uh, sometimes it's a curatorial stuff of themes of uh, of a poetics instead of choosing one artist specific, but taking one big team like I did once in the about the creation of the, the avant-garde in the 50s in Brazil so it was mixing furniture glassware and and art so um, it depends a lot of but it cannot be compared because you're 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 making a cut when you are a, cut, a creator and you have to select the direction of your cut and when you're an artist you're producing because you want to produce you need to produce Sometimes you know what you are going to provoke in the people, but sometimes you even don't know what, what you're going to provoke in the people, you know. Sometimes you just, it's something that comes, comes out from you. I, I had, used to work with some artists that they were painting every day and the, their motifs were so different from each other every day. You couldn't put, let's say, oh, this guy paints like that. But when you are a creator, you choose. Like, I want to cut like this, I want to, it's like cutting a fish, you know. You, you said, okay, I want to, I want the belly, so I want, all the section of the belly, or I want, the, want something with the line in the belly. So it's it's very different. I don't think it's the same. It's the same. Uh, the same paths. Tell me about your future thoughts for Casa de Carbonara because COVID. Uh, how do you see it evolving or changing or adjusting to the new situation? I mean, it's becoming more and more for some, somewhere that I can create and uh, produce some uh, things on knowledge and some um, cultural activities in terms of uh, documentary. I have two projects for books as well in this midway that I'm involved with. So I'm trying to make Casa Carbonara my base for working with uh, culture and history. So it's, like, it's more like a production company than a, than a restaurant now, nowadays. I mean, I still receive a lot of people, uh, my friends. I still do some dinners for friends as well. And in the end of the year, I've been doing the last three years, this uh, huge dinner with some chefs that I invite from other parts of the world cooking. 
So the first year was Virgilio, Mauro, José and Alberto from Brazil. The second year was Virgilio, Mauro, Pia, Manu Bufara, and Elena Rizzo. And this last year, Hasmus from Geranium came with Virgilio and José as well. So I do this big dinner, but it's, I invite some friends, some people from the food business in Sao Paulo, and it's every, everything is, is for free. There's no sponsors, there's no paying. This is the, the first thing, the first rule of the house. There's no money involved in any activity of eating here. Food is for friends, it's for free. If, if someone wants to contribute, if someone bring a bottle of wine or bring, bring an ingredient, but... I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. You're more than invited. You know, you and I say I'm I'm waiting for you too here for forever. You know? um, I hope so. I I'm not sure about when they're gonna let me out of the U.S., but I'd be the first one to come. Yeah, I know. I feel the same. You know, I yes. I think I, I, all all the problems aside, I think um, creative people and chefs and artists, everybody is thinking and evolving on a different level and adjusting in the best way possible so i find it very admirable that we're really staying positive um amid of this pandemic um my next question to you is um after the pandemic is over where do you see yourself going first what would be your first destination that's a very good question um i had to <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know actually, you know, I was planning to do a big trip in, in Italy this year. I have a lot of friends there, so I was very keen on going there. But after this quarantine, I would say something between Paris, Denmark or Basque Country, you know? It, it's because it's the, the places I go, I try to go every year, you know? So it's, it's somewhere I, I, I would like to guarantee that I went this year again, you know? So, I think it's a bit different in the summer because in the summer everybody wants to be by the sea. But in the spring, myself, I was thinking Copenhagen, Tokyo, um, Paris, London. Um, now that the summer is completely blocked, I, I'm still having my hopes to go to Tokyo in the fall. But God only knows what's going to happen then. Um, but I think yeah. all of us are craving that travel bug and different food. And, <laughs> but I would say yeah. Lisbon as well, no thinking. Lisbon is so nice. I went to Lisbon so many times the last three years and it's amazing. Yeah. So, Joao, it's been so wonderful to be breaking bread with you. Thank you for being on this edition of Breaking Bread. And I hope to share a glass of uh, nice vino verde with you or some tequila and celebrate and share happiness and food. Thank you so much. And salut. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here and I hope to see you soon and to break some bread with you. Thank you, Joao. <laughs>